Okay. We're doing it. And we are live. Hello, folks. Uh, hope we're going to get into trouble today. I think we will. I'm wearing a tie. Can you believe that? Brian, Brian Summer, you challenged me, and I rose to the challenge. I am amazed. Uh, I didn't know your sartorial wardrobe actually still had a tie in it, uh, but okay. Granted, I did uh, loosen it up a little bit, uh, but I feel like I can do that because it is Friday afternoon, and this is the debut of the Enterprise Month in Review featuring Brian Summer. How you doing, Brian? Doing just fine, actually. Um I, uh, I've been getting emails all week long and text messages from relatives down in Texas. And every one of them starts with, I can't believe it's 107 or 109, you know, and, and all I want to do is send them one back that goes, it's 87 here, <laughs> but, uh, I've, uh, resisted that. Oh, well, yeah, don't, anyway. don't rub it in too much. Um, you'll be on the tarmac soon enough. The karma gods are cruel. Oh. Mm. So, um, anyway, so. Uh, this show is actually not going to have a whole lot of chit chat in it. That's one thing you and I decided. So um, this is the Enterprise Month in Review. Uh, if you enjoy it, we're going to keep doing it. If you don't, we might not. So <laughs> your vote counts. Uh, but but basically, the 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 idea behind the show, uh, I was kind of inspired by a column that Brian used to write for Diginomic about sort of the month in review, and I felt like, you know what, a month in the Enterprise, pretty long time. Let's put our heads up. And so the idea here is we're going to pick some of the top stories, but we're going to give you our take on those stories. Hello, Thomas. Welcome. We're, uh, we're going to give you our take on those stories. Um, so the idea is by the time we get to the end of this, we're going we're gonna to poke some satirical fun as usual, but hopefully we'll give folks a sense of what we think we're, we're sort of kind of what people are maybe missing with the top stories. Also, some of the stories that are flying under the radar that we think matter. And then uh, on top of that, uh, we want to give a few takeaways towards the end. And y'all in the discussion, you're part of this. So please feel to present also your views on what you saw this month. And we got the digital couch segment. This is kind of like a talk show format. So we're actually going to have someone on the digital couch. That is High in Park this month because he's responsible for one of the best blog posts of the month. And, uh, yep. Hey, Brent. Yep. Welcome. Oh, bro. Hammer and big text back. Yeah, we are. We're riding, dude. Whether we can keep this show on the road during event seas remains to be seen. Yeah. So we got Hyen Park coming in at the half hour mark, and he's going to be talking with us about, I think, a pretty important point post that he made around the implications of Zoom's terms of service AI brouhaha. And, uh, and, but really what it means for CXOs in terms of this topic in general. So we'll be getting to him in a bit. So, uh, Brian has also got some visuals. Um, so I'm going to put that into the stream now. So this Brian, what do you got, man? A model of the month. What's going on here? Well, I was going to have a picture of Kate Upton here, but uh, I thought the model of the month might be something that we either see in one of the better, like uh, management consulting mags, or in this case, this was inspired by something you told me, which is you've noticed uh, how much someone's LinkedIn posting ebbs and flows based on their employment status. So we now have this model. Scientific as it is, it shows the um, LinkedIn posting level on the left and run across the bottom is the employment status uh, going Ouch. from fully employed to un fully unemployed. And, you know, the ideal school solution answer is somewhere along that diagonal uh, in the model. Anyway, this we hope will help people decode the activity they are or aren't seeing on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, Indeed. thanks. Thanks, Brent. And you're right. I think it's always uh, it's it's important for someone who bills time to clients that you actually show up with some work, uh, kind of you know, ready to impress upon them. So yes, I do go everywhere with a deck on me. Anyway, so that's our model of the month. Use it with whatever uh, you know care you want to go with. Yeah, and of course, I'm not. I don't mean to insult prominent LinkedIn influencers in any way um, by implying that that they don't have much to work on during the day or anything. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I love LinkedIn completely. So anyway, um, so uh, in, a, in a sec, we're going to, Brian and I are going to get to our uh, top stories of the month. 
Uh, but before we do that, Brian, I think you have a couple other slides we got to get through. Well, folks, go. folks, we uh, we don't have a hundred slides. It's just about ten. So, and we're not going to do them all at once. So, no. Oh, Thomas wants a three dimensional version of the model, Brian. Um, <laughs> so, well, or. I wanted to dust off the technology trapezoid one more time, you know, because that thing's mm. really got legs on it. And if Meg Bear is watching, I know she loves the technology trapezoid, which you can only get with, um, what was that? Um, uh, amazing ERP, uh, I think was the product. But anyway, yeah. Well, maybe we can build you a summer verse where we can just put on the goggles and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and go right in there. Okay, so what's up with leadership and gets flair? I haven't even seen this one. Uh, well, John loves the term le oh, leadership, and it's misspelled, but I kind of like the German version of it up there, leader. <laughs> letter letter schluffing? <laughs> Later. Um, but uh, John loves to talk about leadership, and you'll see him tweet that, uh, that hashtag all the time out there on Twitter. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I found some of John's... Um, flare buttons he left behind at a show we were at and this was one of them that john's a leadership luminary anyway that's one of oh, them man and He's another one he left behind on the next slide um and uh, just uh, you know the fact that he was probably oh. a power woman i don't know what that's all about but uh we'll let you know john well you can... know i love those networking lunches yeah actually i have something to say about events coming up in a little bit but uh but we promised uh very little uh chit chat at the top of the show so i want to get right to it brian so the format now we're going to we're going to move into our uh top stories of the month these are basically a different take on the top stories and yeah. uh yeah i guess that might include generative ai but we're going to try to you know do it with a twist so what, what you got brian what's your top story so i thought this was interesting it's a short article from chief executive magazine and it had this sound bite in there that i pulled out i thought it was important it basically says that um the law tort law is really built around uh knowing what a responsible person would do. I remember this in all the law classes I took, you know, there's a thing called the reasonable and prudent man rule. And what's interesting is in AI applications, if you could foresee something going hinky, then you're basically on the hook for it. So, uh, you know, when we think about autonomous cars, we think about hiring uh, utilities in you know, applications in, H in the HRMS world. If you think a tool could exhibit bias, then you are on the hook for it. So just remember folks, when you embrace AI, you've got to think about um, this liability issue and it's all tied to the concept of foreseeability. And I thought this was a simple enough article to kind of plow through. You don't need to be a legal eagle to get it, but I thought this was important to note. Yeah, I have a similar one for my top story. It's actually one that that Stuart wrote, uh, and it, you know, so so basically, there's I've got two things for y'all in terms of generative AI, because uh, obviously we can't we can't get away from it. But I think what we can do is we can reframe it around what the important topics are, and one one of the big themes basically is that. We got a bunch of fall events teeing up, but there's actually no, hey, Tracy, what's going on? There's actually no major functionality shipping from most enterprise vendors on generative AI, AI till the end of the year. So in one of my posts, I said, like, what are we going to talk about all, all fall? Like generative AI cream puffs and, you know, uh, parachutes and golden parachutes. I don't know. Um, so basically... Um, I want to have an interesting fall, so I want to ask good questions. And one of them that came from one of Stewart's posts was the retail use cases around generative AI. So one of the interesting things I think we should be pressing on and pressing vendors on is narrowing into retail scenarios. And so in this case, uh, Stuart wrote a post called, Can Generative AI Help Walmart to Be Who It Wants to Be? He's been analyzing Walmart for a long time. Anyway, when you dig into the use cases, you can get a little better feeling of what uh, what companies have in store. And a lot of it comes comes into things like, in Walmart's case, things like um, 
okay, they're taking large language models from their partners, but they're applying that to their unique data assets. And they think they can, that can have big implications for things like customer loyalty. Um, but, you know, as I pointed out later in the article, I think some of the stuff Walmart's doing around omni-channel stuff around order online, pick up at store, things like that are actually, in my mind, a little more interesting than 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 the generative AI stuff they have ready at the moment. But I think looking at the industry variables of this is a really interesting point. Um, so, Brian, what do you think of that? Uh, I think the whole L large language model stuff and the training is a whole other can of worms. I actually yep. put language in the not only in the front of a book that I just did, but also in some speaking engagement contracts that basically state you can't use any portion of this content to train anything from a machine learning, large language model, AI, whatever kind of perspective. And if you do, you will face serious economic damages as a result. And I actually put that language in there. Now, I don't know if anybody will read that before their program just goes through and grabs it, but I got them if I find out it's ever been used that way. But anyway, enough on that. Yeah, so real quick, too, I just wanted to to mention this. I, th I think this is kind of interesting. So I probably get 20 pitches around AI stuff a day in my inbox. We're going to get, by the way, we're going to get to the worst PR pitches of the month later in the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I get about 20, 20 of those a day. And so what I decided to do in the spirit of, of the fall season of trying to dig deeper into this stuff, and we're going to get deeper into the training model stuff with high end. So I'm not going to get into that too much now, but what I decided to do was to go come back and basically do a AI challenge to everyone in my inbox saying, if you can give me one or two paragraphs of something interesting on the topics that I want to know about, then, then maybe we'll do an interview, but let's start by giving me one or two good paragraphs. And basically what I was pushing on are things like managing risk, problems of customer data pricing, black box explainability, technical limitations of LLM, difficulties using third-party LLMs and customizing them with customer training data, implications for pricing, use case pros and cons, and a little bit more. I won't read it all to you now. So far, I've received two emails back. Uh, with fairly tepid uh, responses, not very interesting. And so I think that's just an interesting thing. Like now I know for a fact there are people inside of some of these vendors that have good content on this stuff, but I just wanted to point out that we're in a little bit of a tricky point where a lot of the stuff that we really need to know about next is vendors aren't really ready to engage on it yet. So that's going to be our challenge, just try to dig this stuff out, <laughs> help each other figure it out. And then from there, we can really get into how generative AI can actually change work in the enterprise. So that's what I'm working on. I'll let you know if anyone ever responds. Brian, should we look at your next story? Sure. Okay. So sorry. Wait, that AI? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. AI. AI right. is thirsty. Yeah. And sorry, this got all wadded up. I had a number of articles for a deal in my briefcase. And uh, something happened on the plane. But anyway, this is a, a Business Week piece, and it talks about an issue where we don't think about all the big data centers that corporations have and hyperscalers have uh, with regard to the water they consume. Most people are focused on the you know, electricity uh, that's involved in uh, running all the servers and heating and cooling. But the amount of water that gets consumed is quite massive. Uh, this is a soundbite out of that article that talks about how um, one for Meta in Spain is going to blow through 665 million liters of water a year. And it's a resource in a lot of parts of the world that just isn't readily available, if you will. You could put a, it's great to put a solar farm up in a desert to power one of these centers. But where do you get the water to uh, help out with all the cooling is a real issue. Uh, by the way, folks, the the ele just the electricity involved in heating and cooling these uh, centers has gone from sub 1% of total global emissions annually to almost 3.9% in just five years of total carbon emissions. That's pretty impressive growth. And what's fueling it is a lot of uh, behavior in the way 
companies store data, never get rid of it, never, you know, they constantly keep archiving it and putting copies of it up on disk drives that constantly require power and cooling. And uh, then when you add all the training data that companies are pulling together, collecting and building you know, like uh, large language models and stuff with, it's the amount of consumption, the amount of data that's going into these things is growing so rapidly that one analyst described data as a unfortunate byproduct of the digital generation. So anyway, John. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to remove the slides for a sec. You may see them again because Brian has a few more. So what I want to do before we bring Hyde on is I want to talk a little bit about some of the underrated stories. And then Brian and I are also going to give you our most hated buzzword of the month. So I think the underrated stories part is pretty important because that's about helping everyone to think about what the narratives they should be watching are as opposed to just being spoon fed the narratives by whatever PR circus is going on. So Love to ask all of you in the chat what stories you're tracking. What do you care about that maybe isn't getting as much attention as you think? Uh, Brian, I want, I'm going to start this this one off, uh, and this is actually uh, tying into your work, but since you said you weren't going to do it, I'm going to do it. This is uh, e my ESG has teeth article, which I'm actually pasting into the chat. And basically, the concept behind the article is pretty simple. Brian, Brian's uh, recent book on ESG uh, prompted me to rethink a little bit of my assumptions around it. And the argument is basically that historically, IT spending has largely been dictated not by the, the sexy new thing, but by regulatory requirements. And that e and my, my thesis is that ESG increasingly qualifies for that, particularly companies that are doing business internationally, Europe in particular. The U.S., I will concede, is a little bit unpredictable in terms of exactly what regulations are going to fall when. Uh, but in general, it seems to be a tidal wave of regulations. When talking with uh, SAP recently, they told me they're tracking 600 different regulatory nuances in their software right now. So that gives you some sense of like that. But I think the other really interesting thing about it was uh, Brian, the sort of the emergence of what you might call next gen ESG vendors, which includes some of the incumbent vendors we've all heard about, but also some interesting startups, basically thinking a lot about this notion that let's move beyond static reports into much more granular ways of tracking this stuff that help that help companies make better decisions on a even on an hourly basis in terms of things like energy allocation and stuff like that. Um, grappling with things like forever chemicals that had never been grappled with before. Anyway, I think it's an interesting, important topic. I'm not necessarily going to say that I know exactly when the hammer is going to fall and how important it is, but I think it's something that a lot of vendors and customers are overlooking a little bit. Well, I can't disagree with what you have there. I, I just did a whole book on it, like you said, so uh, that would be pretty bad if I did. Uh, I actually did a call this morning with a company that has a whole bunch of technologies that can um, reconstitute, break down, repurpose any number of different kind of plastics and other petrochemical-based products. And uh, it made me really glad that I was a chemistry major for quite a while in college. And uh, uh, I was one of those Sheldon Cooper guys in high school. I'd taken every science class my little poor school district in the middle of nowhere Texas had to offer by the time I'd maybe finished ninth grade. And so I had the whole run of everything science related back then. Um, but I, I was kind of hanging on by the fingernails through that conversation. It was quite fascinating to hear it. Uh, one other call I did this week was with a company that really was beating on the point about this ESG stuff is actually a giant risk management problem. And they were talking about What's going to, you know, why shareholders in particular are demanding companies uh, be much more forthright in explaining what their risk and liabilities are related to everything, uh, forever chemicals, pollutants, carbon emissions, what have you. Because if it turns out later on uh, that in your filings that the SEC is going, looks like it's going to start requiring later this year, uh, that you didn't fully disclose what was going on or you 
uh, you greenwashed things, whatever, and then a big shareholder suit gets filed against the company, that's going to cause some people to lose their jobs. So this think about there's a risk that has to be managed because a company could lose a huge amount of its equity valuation because it failed or misled investors as to what its real environmental, social, and governance status is all about. So this stuff is definitely big. By the way, um, I got a call um, yesterday from a woman who was at a C AICPA event in Chicago, and she was talking about how a big four person came out and was talking about ESG. And the first words out of the woman's mouth were, this isn't about politics. And she went right into the stuff about the risk management alike. And uh, as she was telling me that, I was telling her about an interview I did with an individual who said, and I haven't been able to confirm this yet, that there are the big four are currently looking to hire around 100,000 people to put into a into their respective kind of ESG and CSR practices because they see this as possibly bigger than what Sarbanes-Oxley did to the audit and accounting industry. Yeah, and I just want to also mention, I think this is a classic example of an underrated storyline that people should take seriously. And the reason for that is even after publishing that piece, I got some pushback from someone on LinkedIn who was in my face around that ESG is a political hot potato right now. And 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 I can give you an example from this spring where I was uh, at a vendor where some of their prominent executives said, like, we're not going to talk about ESG very much publicly right now because it's like it's a hot potato, whatever. But then I do some digging and they're working pretty hard on it behind the scenes. And, and not only that, but one of their customers went on stage just an hour later and thanked them for helping them with their ESG issues. So the point being that just because vendors are a little quiet on this publicly at times coming up doesn't mean that it doesn't matter and it isn't important. So this is a really great example of why we need to reframe narratives and not just, and not just assume that what's being talked about the most is necessarily the most important thing. So that's my thing on that. Brian, I got one more non-AI story I wanted to talk about. Do you have any non-AI stories you want to talk about? Or uh, Let's see. We can pull your deck up and see if you have a non-AI no, I, one. I know I got um, that one. Oh, you got the people AI AI. right there in the title. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that one in a little bit. Oh, you got a pay performance one. Uh, well, this you was kind of interesting that I uh, – People using uh, commercial tax software found out that um, their information was being leaked out because of some embedded code in the software and was being leaked out to Google and Meta, and it could take on some other stuff. Uh, and anyway, I was just point, pointing that out. It was, it's like pretty sad when you almost have to go revert back to paper forms because you can't even trust your tax preparation software not to pimp out your uh, personal information to third parties. I really don't ever want to see an advertisement hit my computer screen and said, hey, we noticed that you just took a deduction for a brand new you know, company vehicle. By the way, would you like to buy a set of Michelin tires to go with it? No. If I see that, I'll be joining that lawsuit uh, to go after those folks who pimped out my information like that. Indeed. I have one more non-AI story. Uh, and it, it was interesting because it came to me when I was spending some time thinking about how in just a few weeks, be back on the event trail. And I'm still pretty dissatisfied with, with the nature of event design and the, and the missed opportunities. And I came across a really cool post. It's a guy named David Spinks, S-P-I-N-K-S. He does a Substack newsletter. And he wrote a really cool thing I'm going to riff on called How to Engineer Serendipity. So if you check out those keywords, you can find it. But basically, he's he's talking about this concept of like, I started thinking about like, what's cool about on the ground events? What's cool really is not, honestly, let's face it, most of the programming is not great. And but what's great are the moments of serendipity, right? Running into someone after you got off a panel in the hallway, having this amazing conversation, seeing someone that read something that you wrote 
10 years ago, seeing customers talking over lunch about things and making connections with each other that they hadn't made. Like those serendipitous moments are what redeem a lot of these events, as well as seeing old friends, of course. And so, but the interesting thing about this post is the concept that some of this can be actually designed. So that instead of just hoping that serendipity happens because you bring everyone into the same environment, you actually create event structures that encourage it. And so that's going to be one of my next angles on creative event design is make, making it possible. And I've done some of this in smaller scale before, and it works very nicely. And part of it is this whole thing around like not assuming that everyone's going to mix perfectly. I mean, how many times have you gone to an event, gone to a networking event, found yourself at the wrong table? Trying to extract yourself from that conversation takes 15, 20, 30 minutes. Brian, it happens all the time, man. And I, I know when they stick me at the curmudgeon's row table, that's the one I, I can't wait to get out of and go somewhere else. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, hey. So anyway, I'm going to write about this. So anyway, there, there, it's just a thing around like that. I, th I still think there's a lot of fresh thinking that can be applied to making events better. Uh, we have Thomas asking you, shouldn't they rather sue the tax companies? This is about your last article on the taxes. Yeah. I, I, frankly, I don't care who they sue. Sue them all. Uh, you know, so anyway. All right. Well, that's an inspirational tagline for Friday. Uh, before we bring Mr. Park on, Brian, let's, uh, let's, do, let's, let's do our most hated buzzword of the month. Uh, anyone in the chat, feel free to add your most hated buzzword of the month to our conversation. Uh, oh, wait, we got Melissa here. Uh, were any of the serendipity creating topics relevant to in-person work where everyone seems to be looking to, for serendipity? Um, yes, I would say so, Melissa. Uh, it was it was structured around events. But, yeah, I think you could use that in a work context. You would have to extrapolate it a little bit. Uh, Brian, um, I think you have your buzzwords here. Looks like more than one. Oh, I know. This was... Uh... A, a column. I knew we were going to talk about. Was, it, was this all words. like in one column? Yeah, that's all that one thing there on the far right uh, that uh, oh. Jim Collins had written, and um, uh, you know. But I thought, I thought, Practice, we, how can you have a post like if somebody wants to post a comment? You know, even to this, you need to say like, John, talk about your twenty mile march, and be sure to fire bullets, then cannonballs, and you know, and whatever you do, John, practice productive paranoia because it's about clock building, not time telling. You know, I mean, you get, you know, every, every one of these little sound bites was like something that's just great fodder for really inane post on uh, Twitter or what have you. So I'm going to be taking this with me to all the uh, fall software conferences and see if I can drop a few of these in tweets left and right. Well, I'm going to get to work on building my flywheel right away because I, I haven't done that, man. And I'm thinking that's kind of what I, how I screwed this whole thing up. I'm going to also steal one from Melissa real quick. And Mr. Mr. Hian, Hian Park, if you're watching, I'm going to ask you what your most hated buzzword is as soon as you come on. So just fair warning. Uh, Melissa Swift, uh, I, I stole from you uh, reskilling, but then I saw this article that just showed me bananas on reskilling because it was like, oh, my God. 30% of the workforce has to be reskilled because of AI or whatever. And, and I said, like, we have to define this term if we're going to throw it around like that. Because I'm sorry, like, what I said in my tweet was, like, learning how to use Grammarly is not reskilling. We got we to define what reskilling is if we're going to use that word. So I'm going to write about that in this week's Hits and Misses because I'm going to propose that reskilling means that you actually have to miss work to get the skills you need. If you can just throw something on the computer screen, I, I, how can you – in good conscience, call that reskilling. That's just media angst. Okay, it's time for the digital couch. We actually did it on time. I really wish we had like intro music and stuff. Like, but the problem is like music rights are like really expensive and stuff. But welcome, Mr. Hayun Park. How you doing? Howdy, doing good. How are y'all? Howdy, that's my line. Right. <laughs> hey, I grew up in Tennessee. I use howdy as well. <laughs> Yeah, Melissa, sorry I took your stuff, man. I, uh, that was pretty shameless. If you guys want to see more on Melissa, check out the replay of last um, last week's episode. Okay, so yeah, fear-mongering indeed. Yes, Tracy. All right, we got all kinds of comments flowing in, but I'm going to hold on those for a sec. Because, you know, in the old days, you used to get great blog posts all the time. Um, now, outside of Diginomica, sorry for the plug, um, it, I don't see as many as I would like, but I sure did this month. Uh, Mr. Mr. Park over at Amalgam Insights, 
I think he posted a, a genuine must read in responses to uh, Zoom. Basically, Zoom is really good about like getting ahead of the curve and tripping over itself with with a really important topic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, but the thing I really liked about your post, which you since did update, because obviously this is kind of a moving target, uh, you, you, from the beginning, you kind of anticipated that this issue was not just a zoom issue, but a much broader issue that was going to face and, you know, pretty much every customer and pretty much every, every vendor that they work with. So can you tell us just a little bit about kind of how, why you jumped on the story and kind of why you thought it was important? Sure. So just in case you don't read the Zoom uh, service agreement on a daily basis and keep track of this, um, the the deal here is that Zoom, like every other company out there, has been trying to figure out how to include AI and machine learning into its services. So back in March, they added this whole bunch of language into their service agreement in Section 10, uh, talking about all the ways that they own the data associated with your services. So they had this section around saying, uh, whatever you're using uh, from a data perspective, whatever you say, whatever you type in uh, is data that we have to use to produce the service. And then we're also creating all this uh, additional data associated with uh, the actual video conferencing itself. And then they added this additional bit saying basically that they uh, would be able to license anything that you put into Zoom uh, and and use that going forward for a laundry list of things. So so this uh, language got a lot of attention, uh, I would say, last month when... Uh, when people finally started digging into this and and the further they got into it, the more they realized, wow, we are giving away a lot of stuff. And uh, the the biggest uh, and the biggest uh, issue here was around uh, basically uh, Zoom claiming they had a commercial license to be able to reuse basically for any imaginable purpose, which you can imagine did not go over so well with all of these large companies who have obviously been having uh, discussions within Zoom, uh, including a lot of internal conversations, probably sharing internal documents, probably sharing trade secrets, probably sharing all sorts of research and development discussions uh, because they thought they were doing it in a trusted channel uh, through an enterprise contract where they're probably spending a million dollars with Zoom. So to put this language in suddenly saying, oh, by the way, anything that you've shared Uh, regarding your documents or regarding anything in chat is now something we can use commercially uh, for anything from marketing to AI to machine learning. And by the way, um, also your face, also your voice for everybody who's ever used Zoom. (laughs) So um, so this went public and obviously Eric Yon had to go public and basically say, you know, their, their CEO and say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're not going to use your uh, data to train machine learning models. But then there's still all of this other language talking about how they own your data, how they can license your data, how they can uh, oh, have a commercial license to do whatever they want with your data otherwise. And they they didn't they t- took a little while to change that language. So. Um, after this brouhaha went public, you know, there was about a, a couple of weeks here where, honestly, all of us who cared about this kind of language had to try to figure out, well, what is Zoom really going to have uh, access to? And how does this compare to the likes of uh, Microsoft Teams or anybody else who's providing conferencing language? So uh, in this blog, I, I looked into Zoom's language and found it was a little bit uh, intrusive compared to other uh, companies such as, uh, you know, even Microsoft and Google, which have their own products. And, uh, you know, we're doing this on LinkedIn, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, You know, all sorts of different uh, video conferencing and video streaming solutions. Uh, They mostly have the same types of language talking about how uh, customer data belongs to the customer and the provider has a very limited use right uh, associated just with providing video services and going no further. Uh, Zoom definitely crossed a line in uh, trying to cover their butts because some overactive lawyer decided they had to prove how much they were worth by adding uh, all of this additional language about how data and outputs could be used. 
And the thing is, this is not an issue that is going to be uh, specific to Zoom. You know, now the problem we've got this is we've got generative AI. Uh, everybody thinks they're going to have uh, some sort of special AI, some sort of special model, and now they have to change their software terms to some extent to be able to do AI rather than the traditional data and analytics uh, use use cases that they've been supporting. Uh, so th- now we're going to be in the wild west for a little while dealing with all these uh, legal terms and changes and then the blowback and then the response. Uh, really, This really reflects uh, some of uh, Brian's headlines that he shared uh, earlier today. You know, this is this is just going to be a continuation of that discussion. And so it's really interesting to watch just uh, how AI is now changing our view of software, what we have to look at from a contractual perspective, and what we're going to have to be uh, really keeping our eyes on, uh, you know, on how our data is used and where we're using our data. And it's not like we were doing a great job before as end users of protecting our data and keeping ourselves safe <laughs> in the in the light of everything exactly. uh, security related. Now it just gets even more complicated. Can I just add to that too? One other interesting aspect is I talked to a vendor this week, a large vendor, um, who said that that they're going to be able to aggregate some valuable anonymized data through their current terms of service. And that flagged me a little bit also because vendors are going to try to do this on a opt-out rather than opt-in basis, right? Because they would much prefer to have a few people opt out than have to get everyone to opt in. But the problem that I see is that even if your existing terms of service covers you from a legal perspective, you are raising a whole different kind of discussion when you're talking about training data sets on this type of information. And even if you're legally able to do it, I can't see how vendors can properly go about this without having really close communication with customers around, yeah, this is what you, you've you now opted into, and this is how it's going to be used, and this is how, how it's going to protect you if we use your data without sort of, you know, taking your IP and running with it, essentially. Yeah, and there's this whole question about whether this is even allowed at this point. There are all sorts of lawsuits going out right now about people whose work has been used to feed these AI models in the first place. Like uh, Sarah Silverman is part of a, a lawsuit where uh, OpenAI and Meta are involved, basically saying her book was used to train the model and she did not give permission to do so. And so that's going through the courts as well. Funny how Meta, Facebook keeps showing up over and over again for this stuff. I know, yep. big shock. And, and there's the Ars technical technical article that came out recently about how the New York Times is contemplating a lawsuit against chat GPT and one end result could be chat GPT having to erase its data and start over. Um, not that that right. will happen, but but this is kind of high stakes stuff. Brian, you got any questions for our digital couch guest? I was just going to say, uh, after all these years, I still don't have a Facebook account. I would never have had one and uh, I was turned off initially by the original like terms of service said that they owned all this information about my personal stuff and my content. And uh, Brian doesn't play that game. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and if any of these, uh, uh, if any of these litigants uh, happen to be watching the call and they want an expert witness for a case, call me, I'll be happy to work <laughs> on that trial. But, but Brian, the problem though, is that you can't, the way this is playing out, just avoiding certain black hat companies is is not going to be that easy. I think there's going to be a real blurring of the lines here where it's actually oh, incredibly, incre- you know what I mean? Like, like obviously there are certain companies where it's going to be like, ooh, like, like, like maybe I'll decide this, you know, maybe I'll decide that Zoom is really crossing the line more than the others and I'll standardize on, you know, Google or Teams or something. But in a lot of cases, I think it's going to be very confusing for companies to figure out who is actually doing this in a way that has integrity and and who to avoid. I mean, that's going to be a, not a can be easy thing to do. I, I actually think until you see some very strong uh, regulation come in place that basically requires companies to do to assume that all information is um, private and they have to get explicit permission to use something publicly and that doesn't allow them to sell it and resell it. I remember a case back at home uh, many years ago, where a fellow running for the local, um, uh, see the chief of police or sheriff's department, whatever, 
somebody at the local mom and pop home video store released the list of the movies he'd rented. And let's just say some of them weren't exactly high on the law and order list. And, um, and it cost him the election question was, was it legal? I doubt it. Um, did he have an expectation of privacy? Probably, but the rules weren't well known, you know, 20 odd years ago. And today I think we have even less clarity about what the rules really are. Uh, so, uh, I think, I think going, you're right, John, going at this one company at a time is not going to work. It's going to have to be something more systemic uh, to make it stick. Unfortunately, none of us have the lobbying funds and resources that some of the companies you're talking about have. Yeah, right. I mean, I think we could probably dedicate a couple of shows to this. One would be looking at the consumer implications of this for individual for individuals and one from a more enterprise perspective, because to your point, enterprises do have more resources to throw at these problems. But since we are enterprise month of review, we will stick to the enterprise side of this and ask Hyun, what was your advice and what is your advice for the sort of CXO contingent, CIOs, et cetera, on how they should be thinking about these issues? Yeah, there, there's a few different things. Uh, one is pretty straightforward that uh, you've got to check your software uh, customer agreements closely uh, right now. This is the time to go through them with a fine tooth comb and see if any of them have been changed in the last six months, because uh, most likely if they have, the change is going to be something around AI and using uh, customer data or using some sort of real-time data or some sort, of, some sort of transactional data to try to better understand the customer or to provide summaries or to provide transcripts, uh, you know, all the stuff that they're providing that is more, quote, customer friendly comes because they are somehow feeding your data in and to create some sort of intelligent service. So, it's really important to see what rights you're able to maintain uh, as you do that. And you want, and you have to start figuring out uh, from the customer side uh, or the employee side, you know, what are end users really allowed to put into applications? Do you really have that, uh, that single source of truth and that golden record uh, in that app, in every application that you've traditionally done it at, or do you need to start picking certain applications that really are your golden record uh, because now we can't trust certain ones based on their their agreements or their their specific changes. You know that that's going to be a real pain to support, quite frankly. Uh, but I, I think uh, one other issue uh, that comes up is simply around protecting our data. That we have to take uh, more uh, put more effort into figuring out where our trusted data goes in the first place. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of AI models are simply scraping the web right now. So we need to do little things like uh, making sure we've got that robots.txt uh, page uh, uh, file on our web page. Uh, this is something you just put on the your in, inside of your folder, basically saying uh, what can and can't scrape data off of your website. Uh, it's something your webmaster should be aware of. And it, just little things like that of understanding where your data is being pulled into AI models uh, and um, and making sure that doesn't happen, for, frankly, for most of us, because we don't want that to be happening without our agreement. So I've been telling clients for years, uh, I'm just going to piggyback on Hoon's point here, that um, when you read the contracts, uh, I, I actually ask clients to demand that vendors give you all contracts in paper. There can be no embedded URLs. And that's because they can unilaterally change the URL any day, any moment, and you have no visibility to the change until, unless you proactively go back and look at it yourself. So make it all in paper. That's number one. Number two is uh, not to... Um, is that you will not accept any contract that's greater than say a hundred pages, because frankly, folks, if you can't distill what the license is all about or a subscription in under a hundred pages, you don't know what the hell even you're selling. Mm -hmm. And certainly a customer can't either. My point being that you have economic power as a, 
buyer of enterprise software before you do the deal. And so you need to assert that power then because you're never going to get it once the software is installed. And you've got to also put penalties in there if they try to slip things through. And that also goes to, and they can never give you a click-through contract, which allows them to just... Um, uh, apply new terms and conditions just because some user somewhere in your company hit a hit I agree on some click through screen mm -hmm. and commits the company to a whole new set of terms and conditions that no one in procurement legal or anyone else had ever looked at so yeah this is a this is just a screw up of in great proportion and unfortunately it gets uh, little attention because a lot of people are just so eager to finally get a contract or whatever a relationship with the vendor done that they tend to gloss over all this other stuff thinking legal is going to handle it. No, you, you need to own this problem and own it from start to finish. Yeah. And we can flip that around too and say that vendors that come with more simple, understandable agreements and engage with customers transparently on this are going to have, I think, an advantage in the market. Um, real quick, just catching up on some comments. Um, Tracy talks about dropping the overreachers. This is where our power is. On yep. the consumer side, Tracy also talking about reading the terms and agreements before clicking that little box, which mm -hmm. ties into Brent Leary's uh, post around terms of service DR, TOSDR.org, where you can put these agreements through uh, an AI generator. And by the way, I think AI might actually be helpful in that regard at some mm -hmm. point. There, I'm sure there will be AI services that crunch these agreements and redline problematic passages. So let's sick AI on AI. Uh, I'll throw that out there. <laughs> and, and Melissa says, fascinating point on the dark side of customer centricity need to renegotiate boundaries. Yeah. I mean, it I, sounded I like the... you, were not, you were nodding around this sick AI on AI. That's an interesting one, huh? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, one of the uh, so generative AI, I think it's a little bit overrated in cr terms of creating content overall. I think it does kind of a mediocre job overall, but I think it's really great at summarizing uh, yeah. information. Uh, my my brother Leonard actually uh, works in legal tech. He he is creating products uh, based on summarizing uh, copyrights, patents. Uh, lawsuits, uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, because they're at massive scale and, you know, it's tens of thousands of pages to look through a big corpus. So how do you summarize all that stuff? And so, you know, we talk about this stuff uh, on, on the back end, but, and, you know, it turns out that generative AI is a great way of being able to funnel, call it, you know, thousands of words and then figure out what is the 300 word summary uh, that really matters, or what are the actual terms that matter the most based on how you uh, model your prompt to to look for specific terms and conditions within the the massive document. Indeed. So I wrote a post about SAP's AI strategy and my commentary on that. But within that post, uh, I I talked about and I want to ask the two of you about what you think on your questions. So what I said is readers may rightly ask that given most generative AI functionality won't debut in general ava availability until end of the year, what the heck are we going to talk about during fall event season? AI powder puffs and marketing confections? My personal goal is to dig much further into the specifics. And I listed a bunch of questions that vendors have provided very unsatisfying answers to up until this point. The questions include things like, how will vendors train their LLMs? Will they use third-party LLMs? Will, how will customer data be protected if it's used by a third party? Will customers embrace the use of their data in aggregated fashion via the existing terms of service, which we just covered? Mm -hmm. Will vendors try to pull a Zoom and adjust their terms of service on the fly, which we covered? How will explainability, one of the most important pe missing pieces in AI so far, be improved? How will AI systems not only minimize their own biases, but be used to challenge human bias patterns inside of companies? I'm putting vendors on notice. I'm going to be asking these questions. I hope you are ready. I hope you have fun because I'm not going to put up with, oh, we can't answer those questions anymore. This fall is when I want those questions answered. So hello. Uh, do you guys have other questions like that on your minds? Yeah, you know, I just think of this from kind of a, a technical perspective first. So when somebody says I've got a generative AI solution, there's uh, there's four layers that I think of. Uh, the top layer is around uh, kind of prompt management, custom prompting, where you're just uh, helping uh, the user to figure out how to ask the question, maybe adding a little bit of detail to so that you get a better answer. 
Uh, the second layer is about um, what's called a retrieval augmented generation, which is a fancy way of saying, I I'm going to uh, look at some other uh, selection of data, probably the applications database uh, as context for asking the question, and uh, maybe go through a process where that data gets masked before uh, going to the LLM so you don't give away customer uh, data uh, or or user data or, or whatever, uh, you know, uh, trade secrets might uh, come into play. So does that even happen? You know, that that's kind of a second layer of where to dig into. The third layer of digging in is actually going into the model itself and starting to fine tune uh, some of the assumptions that go in from an algorithmic and mathematical perspective. And then the fourth is actually creating your own LLMs from scratch, which uh, like Bloomberg has done, but not many other companies have done uh, to this point. So there's like these different layers that I'm looking at and trying to figure out which one of these is the software company really doing and then kind of digging in and figuring out. Uh, and then based on that, you know, what are the governance questions uh, that that come into play at, at at each level, you know, but this is a nuanced discussion. And right now, right, it just feels like everybody's throwing crap against the wall and calling it, a, you know, AI, superpowers, magic. <laughs> Brian, I know you don't like to reveal all the questions you're going to sucker punch uh, executives <laughs> with. Uh, yeah. the, el the element of surprise is part of your shtick. We know that. But do you want to put them on notice with anything now they should be getting ready for? So I listen carefully to these AI pitches, and I'm trying to figure out, is this something that's going to be run on a private AI kind of, you know, data set and remain as such? Or is it going to be on the public side? And is that distinction clear to the people that are going to be using it? That's the right off the bat. That's the one of the first things is. And then second is in the private ones, what does the vendor actually get to own and control? Uh, you know, do they uh, take advantage of some of the learnings, even though the data is supposed to remain private, they may still be able to pick up some stuff. So I'm looking at how, how good are these boundaries from public to private and from mostly from private back to the vendor, I want to know uh, how clean all those delineations are. And there's rarely been, so far, I haven't really seen much of any kind of discussion going on in vendor events. Uh, and that second thing is, uh, you know, when you get past, what no one seems to want to talk about is, um, uh, there was this old um, adage that if you used a few great like programmers you could build some great product in record amount of, you know record short amount of time but the closer you get to using like large numbers of very average kind of programmers then you end up creating a very below average product in a very long period of time and i think what happens is there's not enough discussion about what happens to the pollution of the database when you start pulling in all this randomness we had a great case study for this years ago when Microsoft had the, uh, was it Bob? Uh, it was an AI utility and people started feeding it all kinds of racist data sets. And then oh, it yeah, started. The, the oh, are you talking about yeah. Tay? Hmm? <laughs> you're talking about good old Tay that lasted like 24 hours? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, can't, hey, I don't yeah. think it made it through a full day. Right. And so we're not hearing much discussion about the pollution problem and what that does to degrade uh, the quality of the stuff that comes out. And the more you steer solutions to the public side, I think the more apt you are to see a lot more of that kind of problem. And I don't think we're having enough discussion on that. Um, anyway. I'll, I'll save you. the I'll save the rest for you know. Yeah, I'll put I know that you're in my not gonna, munitions store. I know um, you're not going to give away all your good stuff because you got to save that last gotcha. I know that. <laughs> uh, hi, and uh, we'll give you the last word on this topic. Any would did anything we didn't touch on that is important? I one of the things that I still think is a fundamental problem right now is that the, the data people don't talk to the math people or the developers, uh, basically. Uh, one of the uh, big recent issues that uh, has come up is that there's a data set called Books 3, which is one of the fundamental databases that has been used to train a bunch of these open source models. And they found out this Books 3 consists of 
basically 200,000 copyrighted books. Um, to, just, you know, there's no open source anything about it. They just, you know, ripped out, uh, you know, famous books from whatever, Stephen King and, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling. It's like all these famous authors. And they use that to feed the model because, you know, the people feeding the model were just thinking, you know, put in as much data as possible and make that model uh, accurate. And if they had talked to anybody in data governance for even a second, you know, they would have known this, this is probably not a good idea. You should probably talk to somebody first. Mm. Uh, so that uh, fundamental misalignment is still uh, very common. I think uh, a lot of businesses, uh, not even just on the uh, software side, but even just on the standard enterprise side, working on AI going forward, have the potential to get bitten by this uh, if they don't have the, the data and the data science people working together. Well, and the fascinating thing from a risk management perspective is that once garbage goes in, or in this case, protected IP goes in, it's not nearly as simple to pull that back out, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as it would be if it were a traditional database where you could just delete a record. Um, right. So that's that really complicates the risk management aspects of that considerably. Uh, what's your most hated buzzword of the month, Mr. Park? What, what uh, buzzword is driving I'm, you crazy? It, it's the same one that I've always got, which is digital transformation. I never know what it means. I, I'm supposed to be an IT expert. I hear that phrase and I never, ever, ever understand what it's referring to. So if have you, you, you ever it, met, you don't know what it you, means, you're not alone. Have you ever met anyone? Have you ever met anyone or found a company that is transformed in some way that makes you say, "Oh my God, you transformed"? Well, uh, like I think Domino's actually did it, but they, ironically, they don't tend to call it digital transformation. They, you know, they call it modernizing and you know becoming a better company. Uh, <laughs> while digital transformation, when somebody actually says it, usually means, "Yeah, we we." changed our database or we, we brought in a data lake or, you know, something you know, the that funny thing. The funny thing is I picked up a Domino's pizza about a week ago from local Domino's first time in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like the people there that night felt transformed. In any way. <laughs> um, didn't have that vibe, uh, uh. but, uh, but yeah, no, that it is a good point though, because they definitely, their digital interface is a lot better. So if you want to call that transformation, I guess you could. Sure. Why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us today on the digital couch segment. You, you lived up to the billing. Much appreciated. Thanks for the great post. Oh, my pleasure. Good job. <laughs> oh, and by the way, you uh, for, for readers, you should also check out the other essential post where you described uh, generative AI as what was it? Was it, it was mediocre? Instant, the word instant mediocrity, instant That's mediocrity. What it gives you. Instant which, mediocrity. Which I think is a really important phrase, which you did not mean as an insult, which was the most interesting part about it, uh, which was you you were basically saying that there's actually some use cases for instant mediocrity. So I encourage people to check out the post and see what Mr. Park meant by that. Look forward to seeing you on the road this fall, sir. Catch you soon. All right. See you soon. Later. Take care. All right. I wish we had the digital couch outro music and the live house band, but sorry, folks. The show is a work in progress, but you can imagine maybe in the future we would have that. Brian, not bad, huh? That's good. He brought some good content. No, and actually, that comment on mediocrity just uh, was just has been rattling through my head here for the last couple of seconds because I remember getting furious with a customer service person one time, and I told them that um, that. Uh, my clients demand nothing short of perfection for me. The least I expected of you was mediocrity, and you failed to even rise to that standard of excellence. Ouch. And my wife was standing there when I said that. And she goes, you know, you just made that poor guy feel like he's about one inch tall. And I go, yeah, but maybe he'll fix his attitude and, um, you know, become a better person, you know, for it. But anyway... So what do we want to do, John, at this uh, Well, I want to I want to quickly go through our most hated PR pitches of the month and then do a wrap. So All right. uh, if anyone has any final comments on what you picked up on from the month that we did not cover, could you please post your comments now? Uh, I'm going to pull your slides back up, Brian, because I think you have some, your most hated PR pitch. That, that's Was this the, the one? one? Yeah, and it's a real company, and I, I – 
debated whether I wanted to block them out or not, but uh, this actually, when I saw this, uh, the company's actually AI guest post, and I thought when I saw this that they're using AI to write guest posts for people's blogs, but no, they're actually human beings writing it, so I don't know what the AI part of it is, but the fact that I can't figure it out tells me it failed, uh, you know, so anyway, um, that's that's all that one was. Yeah, I had so many ridiculous ones this month uh, that it's hard for me to pick just one. But I went with the subject header, how the metaverse creates creatives empower the modern mood board. Say that again quicker. Uh. <laughs> how the metaverse creatives, in other words, creative yeah. types, empower the modern mood board mood board okay. so anyway while we've been prattling on around the implications of generative ai the metaverse is making major strides with the modern mood board well while the, while <laughs> everyone ponders you, that uh there was this fast company piece uh, that said last april the coca-cola company issued a triumphant press release announcing that it had introduced a soft drink in the metaverse that's the first sentence of this article. I couldn't read the rest of it from that point forward, but um, but it just tells me that when we need a soft drink in the metaverse, something's gone really wrong with the people on this planet. One of my favorites from the whole summer was the gener the startup doing generative AI for mushrooms, and um, one of the one of the golden rules around generative AI is the more dangerous your outlier use cases are or, or any form of AI, really the more uh, scared you should be about that AI. So for example, that's why autonomous driving has been so difficult uh, because, you know, the outlier cases are, are really dangerous. And I said to, I was like, you know, some mushrooms are pretty dangerous, right? <laughs> like you, you, you kind of want a hundred percent accuracy with mushrooms. Anyway, they're like, yeah, we know, but we're working on it. I'm like, I wish you luck with that. Which, which ties back to the very beginning a deal where we talked about the foreseeability of harm of, from like an AI application is a tort problem uh, coming at you. Thomas, regardless of the sub subject line, who needs a metaverse pitch these days? Hey, Thomas, does that mean that I won the Web 3.0 debate from just a few months ago? Because I felt like I won it at the time. But I, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make a victory lap, but I felt like maybe maybe i can take a victory lap on that anyhow uh sorry accenture but you have to throw out the web me slide deck better well, luck next time thomas can collect that award in his second city kind of um you know world. oh indeed uh, all right yeah let's <laughs> is there an award show going on in the metaverse right now that i'm missing that uh, could could be all right brian so uh hey everyone thanks for joining us for our first enterprise month in review I hope you enjoyed the format because we're probably going to try it again. Oh, he says I won. Awesome. Thanks, man. I have to see if my opponent will concede defeat yet or not. Um, but it, he, he seemed to, at the time, he wasn't ready to concede defeat. He said the revolution is still coming, so we'll find out. But anyhow, so uh, what we want to do is just basically refine this format each month. If you If you like it, let us know. Uh, cause we'll keep doing it in some cases. I might even pull like a guest from the audience, which could be a fun, uh, way to kind of have a very organic conversation. So we'll see about that. Brian, um, just want to talk about the takeaways for, for the month. Um, one thing that we didn't get into this time, which I think is still percolating a lot is the future of work. Uh, zoom put their foot in it again by, you know, reinstating mandatory, office hours, which I thought was very ironic from a remote work innovator. Uh, but but in general, I think the future of so-called flexible work is really under fire versus sort of the command and control, you know, office centralization trend and rationalizing real estate. I think the future work is fascinating around that topic. And that's not like a monthly story. That's going to be a story for the year, I think, is kind of how companies uh, figure that out, which one's you know, innovate around it, which ones go back to square one and start over, do it the way they always did. So that's, that's a good one. I think we had a lot of AI stuff. So we covered that. Anything else? Uh, I, I have several different 
uh, folders laid out here of things we could have gone with today. I'm sure we'll pick them up on subsequent deals, but I had, I should stuff on uh, some of the supply chain kind of challenges, which we didn't, you know, get anywhere close yep. to that. Uh, the HR one is actually quite fascinating because um, uh, I think much of the discussions really around like return to office or, you know, what have you, or work from home uh, need to always be, excuse me, looked at the context of what else is going on. And right now we're seeing a bit of a resurgence of COVID. And so I don't really care what somebody's, uh, you know, particular opinions are. If we end up going back a little bit more pandemic-like, uh, that may change the dynamic of this. Just an example, though. And, uh, you know, there are issues about even how we're going to repurpose office space uh, and, you uh, uh, you know, so uh, what else do I have here? Um, the uh, future work also, you know, what was interesting is I got a whole different world view and perspective of things when I was in India you know, earlier this month uh, at a big HR show there. So things are a bit locational. They are situational. They are driven by um, public health and other kind of issues. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about this the rest of our natural lives as more change continues to enter the dialogue. Anyway. Indeed. Thomas uh, raises, didn't hear much about digital transformation recently. How about that? Yeah, well, we just kind of made fun of it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I think that's an interesting sort of ongoing thing because uh, I think AI has kind of obscured the digital transformation conversation for the moment. And cybersecurity, indeed, another topic we could probably return to more adequately in the future. And I agree with your supply chain one. We should probably hit on that next time. And one I would throw out there is uh, there's been some interesting discussion going on about uh, the future of manufacturing. And we're seeing more interest in res uh, reshoring things back to North America and maybe out of countries like China. And as a result, the question comes up, how well prepared are, uh, for example, U.S. companies and being able to reestablish this stuff? Do we have the jobs, the skills, the people? Do we even know how we want to configure these plants? And it even ties into how tr digitally a transformed factor of the future, like will these new facilities be? There's a lot of digging on that will have to happen on that, but it's going to be uh, an interesting chase. Mohammed says a terrific episode. Timely topics in the future work versus traditional command and control management style will remain unresolved until the next generation of leaders gain more foothold in the C-suite. Uh, I don't think you're wrong about that, Mohammed. But the one thing I would say, and what I'm hoping for, is I'm hoping that 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 companies really try to differentiate around this topic instead of everyone sort of going back to the off, you know, rigid office policies, because I'd like to see some open competition for, for different approaches to talent and different approaches to work. In fact, we had a talent question earlier that we didn't get to. Um, but that to me that you're right. I don't think there's going to be like any revolution in flexible work, but I think some uh, companies are going to advance that topic. And I would love to kind of see the competition, if, if, if I think it's a better way, then let's see some companies prove that out with a more flexible style versus the more command and control. So let's, let's, let's duke it out in the marketplace for now. Oh, and Thomas said earlier, who reskills their workforce? They rather fire, do not find skilled people, and then complain about the talent shortage. Well, you know, Brian, we've got a bunch of tech HR tech shows coming up, so I have a hunch we're going to be revisiting those topics as well. So. And, you know, shy, bashful me, I'll probably not ask the tough kind of questions in that regard, you know, to the executives. Oh, those. no, I'm sure you will. Be. I'll be just hanging back. Um, yeah, give us a softball, please. Oh, yeah. Have Brian Summer ask the next question. Yeah. <laughs> give us a softball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I am a little kinder and gentler than I used to be. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still going to come. I really want to see HR vendors in particular tackle some of the problems they keep avoiding year after year after year. Like when are you are going to go help companies actually deal with psychopathic bosses? And they never want to touch that because that's their customer. And uh, they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. It's a bad way to go, though. 
from a coverage well, standpoint, in just in just about uh, less than a week, Google Cloud Next kicks off. We'll have someone on the ground there, and then in just a couple weeks after that, Dreamforce kicks off the fall event season in earnest. So you can count on Tarmac Twins here to come out there. And I'll uh, be at uh, OC Tanner Ceridian uh, Oracle. I may walk into success factors i think you're going you're covering success factors though and i will uh, be there you'll we'll both a, be at work day i think there's a lot of stuff yep. going on yep so uh, anyhow uh thanks all for joining bring your saltiest commentary we'll try to do it again in about a month hope you liked it see you next time take care buddy later